Body Watch is produced by WBH Boston in association with American Health Magazine. Hi, I'm Dr. Red Duke, and I'm your host for Body Watch. This time on Body Watch, we're entering a world of schizophrenia. It almost always strikes young people in their teens and early 20s. They're acutely aware that something has gone terribly wrong with their minds. A brain disorder that scientists, after years of frustration, are just beginning to understand. Now y'all just hold on, it'll be going away. There's a lot more to come. Come on, bud. Body Watch is made possible by the makers of NutraSweet brand sweetness. Taking good care of ourselves makes life a little better. And NutraSweet makes it a little better. Apparently, Vincent Van Gogh led a truly tortured life. Now they be classified as a psychotic. Some believe that he was a schizophrenic as a form of psychosis. His deeply personal and intense painting seemed to of what many psychiatrists believe to be a schizophrenic existence, socially isolated in a captive of his own mind. You know, schizophrenia is a devastating illness. Its consequences are tragic. It usually captures its victims in their adult lives just as they are beginning. And in spite of the fact that two million Americans are affected by it until recently, it was a disease that was largely a mystery. I start right in the morning. For five years now, I wake up, and my mind starts right on me. Some patients hear voices that tell them what to do, some don't. Some just hear voices. I felt that the TV was watching, and uh, they were talking to me on, on the TV. These voices are like policemen, judges. It's always accusing me of being God or Jesus. I was some sort of God, uh, many gods. Suddenly I started getting, imagining bodies inside of my body and blood coming out of the top of my head. I remember being really confused and um, kind of hopeless. This is depressing and we feel so bad, so bad. Hallucinations, voices, grand delusions, confusion, and depression, they're all aspects of schizophrenia. It's an illness puzzling. It can only be defined by its symptoms. Experts have yet to put together a list of symptoms common to all schizophrenics. Little wonder it's difficult to diagnose. For the victims and their families, it can be hell to endure. How are you doing? When I first started to know there was something different about Malcolm was when he was about eight years old, actually. First he quit a job, uh, uh, quit his job, and then it, Malcolm had been a very good worker before that. But after he quit that job, he never ever tried to find another one. Don Lee now visits her 25-year-old son at a psychiatric halfway house run by the Canadian government. Once in a while, I, I wondered if, if he had a mental problem, but you don't like to think that about your own child. And I thought he was just being lazy. In fact, Malcolm couldn't work because he couldn't concentrate. Like other schizophrenics, even when the imagined voices weren't bothering him, he simply couldn't organize his thoughts. It felt like something was constantly banging me back in the head, and that jolted my brain. So I would completely lose uh, sight of what I was thinking. It was banging all the time, everything, and I'd have to try to start over, and then I'd whimper. And then I'd be going confused, and uh, it, had, it got more and One more. One day he, he went back. out and uh, he started hallucinating, and so he got a bus to the hospital and told me from the hospital and told me that he was in the psych ward. I kept thinking that he would be, you know, in weeks or, and I guess in a way, um, I still do that, only now I think in a year or two. Malcolm is better than he used to be, but when he takes the drugs that help control the hallucinations. The story typifies schizophrenic through. He is of particular interest to researchers because he has an identical twin brother who does not have schizophrenia. Both brothers are taking part in studies at the National Institute of Mental Health in Washington. The first thing the family was told was that schizophrenia is nobody's fault. You know, my mother blamed herself a lot, and she had a lot, and a lot of it's out of guilt, as well as love of uh, 
her child. It's stupid because it's, just, it's a disease of the brain. I mean, if your child is born retarded or your child is born with multiple sclerosis or something like that, nobody blames you. They may blame you a little bit, but they don't blame you as they don't put you down as a parent. Dr. Fuller Torrey heads the study for compare 67 twins. The nice thing about twin studies is you have a perfect genetic control. In the pairs in which one has disease and the other does not, by definition, what one has who is sick is non-genetic because they started out with the same genes. So by using the identical twins in which one is sick and the other is not, we can start to sort out the non-genetic aspects. And we're looking for things, viruses, we're looking at chemical abnormalities. Uh, we know that something gets in the brain and changes the history in the brain and we're using the twins as one way to get the answer to that question. Using a number of newer images, Dr. Torrey and his colleagues have been able to pick on some important variation in the brains of schizophrenic patients. Variations in structure as well as function. This device, for instance, measures the function of bow while the subject performs a particular task. Radioactive tracers are either inhaled or injected. The result is a surface image that shows how our different parts of the brain are working. Other methods, such as the positron emission tomography, also known as a PET scanner, allows researchers to observe function even deeper inside the brain. Dr. Daniel Weinberger has been instrumental in developing these windows into the mind. One of the nice things about these functional imaging techniques is it's possible to look at a medical phenomenon like physiology and an observable phenomenon like behavior at the same time. So it's a way of, of asking how much bang in physiological terms do you get for the buck behavioral terms. The mental activity that we've had particular success with is an activity called the Wisconsin card sorting test, which is a simple abstract reasoning problem solving test that patient schizophrenia for whatever reasons tend to have difficulty with. We find that normal individuals activate a particular part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex while they're engaged in that behavior. We find that patients with schizophrenia, as a group, tend not to activate that part of it. Abnormalities in structure have also been identified using a new tech, magnetic resonance electromagnetic field, the components of the tissues by producing tiny electrical impulses that are used to construct the picture of the brain. An important observation was made once this technology was used to compare the brain structure of sick and healthy twins. The sick twins always had larger ventricles, which is the bi-shaped area in the middle of the brain. Looking at sets in which one has schizophrenia and the other does not. Uh, one thing clear is we can differentiate the brain. We can tell which is the twin who has schizophrenia in virtually every case. The differences are not dramatic, but the differences are clearly there. And through that, we hope to be able to think where in the brain the differences take place. Since the ventricle is a cavity in the middle of the brain, scientists say in large ventricles may indicate there is less brain tissue. Until recently, it was believed this reduced brain size was a result of the illness itself. But new evidence suggests the malady exists years before the illness ever appears. The key thing about these findings is that they've been observed at the on the illness. Uh, they've even been observed in at least one uh, patients before they got ill at all. We are stuck with having to explain interaction, the fact that pathology be sitting around in your brain doing nothing new having no apparent impact, in a dramatic way at least, on how you, how you behave, until early adult life. And in spite of brains, this same pathology now, now begins to have a profound brain functions uh, and how you behave. Weiners conclude that schizophrenia is probably triggered by a series of normal biological changes that a schizophrenic system tolerates. And even the underlying problem is the result of something that went wrong during the brain's development, either in you or during the first year of life that doesn't easily explain other known fact about schizophrenia that it tends to run in families. Dr. Right. Holtzman believes the underlying cause is genetic. Right. For over a decade, he's been studying certain eye-tracking maladies in and their family. What happens in schizophrenic patients and in a large number of their uh, relatives is that the fault which is smooth is not smooth. discovered that it occurs in about half close relatives to a free degree relative schizophrenic This is if me a mucker passion of schizophrenia. The next is to try to uh schizophrenia this is difficult to do. A schizophrenia fan is pay a far too fit on genes. There's a group a gene with one that carries for a ability to it. Have a gene down on chromosome. The parrot is missing. But they don't wish the half What you're going to series of 
Lucy is fine that are the same that are in a row. Me for what might carry something and therefore predisposed to the corn part of it being whether in deficit or an early in the tested like patient to achieve low scores and attention to the findings underscore widely healthy about chemical causes of the illness. At the moment, popular hypothesis of schizophrenia is that it involves excess dopamine with neurotransmitters uh, in the central nervous system and in the brain. Other types of research have also indicated that dopamine has something to do with relating attention. So that what we are working on now, whether faulty attention, the inability to pay proper attention to the environment, is one of the first signs of an excess of dopamine that then increasingly disturbed behavior at later ages. The theory that dopamine played a key role in schizophrenia can be traced to an accidental discovery about 30 years ago. Right. Doctors found that certain drugs called neuroleptics control right. the most severe symptoms of the illness. Later they found that they somehow interfered with dopamine activity. But if you still don't know for how these drugs work or why they work for some but fail to work, find those answers the purpose of the ward run by Dr. David Carr. There are very few things in medicine that have been demonstrated so many times in so many controlled studies. That uh, is the effectiveness of neuroleptin reducing the key symptoms of schizophrenia. The irony has mission is that it doesn't remove the illness. What's worth, neuroleptics fail to correct the underlying thing problem. Confusion, the inability to break, described by patients like Jane. Gosh, it's hard to say. I was so I was totally confused. I felt I felt um safe and less confused when I was just around someone I knew um, very well, like my mom. Confusion, frustration, depression, anger, and fear. Each of these emotions is clearly visible in an interview with Roger. It takes several months before doctors found a medication that would work for him. How are you doing? Hi. Good. What's been happening this week? No. No? No. Who are you talking to? Nobody. Who was that? What's your mouth? I'm not able to tell you talking about. You don't know what I'm talking about? Very often the symptoms of the illness may interact with you as a physician. Hostility and anger, paranoia. This is not always pleasant. Dr. Picard says the rewards come. Like Roger are finally to understand their illness and look forward to their future. If you have a new illness that keeps you in well, there's things you'd like to do with your family, you know, you want, or you'd like to do them. But I'm, you know, I'm in a position right now where you're not well. I have to take everything to the clear steps so one way, you know, unless doctors. People who have the illness remain people. And despite many changes in their behavior and their ability to function and the way they are simply, you see the person behind it and they have all the differences that every normal person or non-affected person has. Um, and there's a richness to that. I don't know when it happened or why, but, you know, I know I have this disease now and I'm gonna have to live with. God gives me serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know. You know, in recent years, scientists have made some major inroads into understanding just how the chemistry of the brain really works, both in health and disease. And yet, there are many aspects of schizophrenia that remain unexplained. But in all of this work, some important medications called neuroleptic drugs have been developed that allow 75% of schizophrenics to maintain some control over their symptoms. And simultaneously, some important rehabilitative programs are being developed with an awareness that schizophrenics on a treatment regimen can work and function on their own. Now, Dr. Holly Atkinson, our medical correspondent, has found some real optimism, the luscious, among those folks who work with these patients. Red, schizophrenia is an organic disease, a brain disease, which, while not curable, is treatable. Yet many families of schizophrenics don't have a clear understanding of it. They continue to hide their loved ones behind euphemisms such as nervous breakdown or by sending them off to the state hospital. However, the condition is by no means hopeless. The good news is, is that schizophrenics can reclaim portions of their lives. It is estimated at least 90,000 people with schizophrenia are homeless. That's close to 25% of all the homeless people in this country. Most of them would have been hospitalized 30 years ago. 
But today, drug therapies have allowed many patients to leave the psychiatric ward treats. It is here they often face a cruel irony. They neglect to take the very medications that have set them free. When she's not taking her medication, she's, um, she gets very depressed. She doesn't take care of herself. Um, she's just a different person. Meanwhile, nearly half a million patients, the overwhelming majority, live with their family. And it is the families in this country who are getting organized and starting to demand that more attention be paid to schizophrenia. We want a right treatment. In the we are archaic. Our children have a right to treatment. They have a right to be in the streets, but not a treatment. We want to see that treatment in safe, humane, caring, top shelf facilities. We want to see services in the communities. We want to see meaningful day programs. We want to see meaningful jobs. We want to see social clubs where they will have a place to form groups and to be together and have some sort of social life. It is a tall order. But the number of alternatives for families and patients is growing. This home called Work Life is one example. This morning we need to decide what we want to do for housekeeping and what we want later for production. So the five wow. residents who live here are no longer sick enough to be in the hospital, but they aren't well enough even for a halfway house. All have schizophrenia. The whole day is really planned out, and the purpose of that is to help them develop routines themselves and organize themselves. Founder Joe Sandro says the home provides a much-needed step down for people like Debbie, who had been hospitalized for 12 years. She is still trying to grasp what freedom is all about. I'd like to uh, get an apartment and invite all my friends over every day, night, <laughs> and have parties. <laughs> This is the first time she's been out of the hospital in that 12-year period. Made um, uh, a good adjustment to that, and that's really been the focus of her program right now, just getting her used to being not on a lock ward, uh, not in a hospital kind of setting. The program had to offer, but it is expensive, between five and $7,000 a month per resident. As of yet, none of it is covered by any insurance plan. The cost of down is the resident. Jamie, in fact, may soon become the first graduate. When I was in other hospitals, I just sat around and did nothing, you know. But now I'm here and I'm doing things, and it's make it's my mind off my problems. It's making me, it's helping me more, and I'm getting better faster. Jamie may even be ready to get a job soon, which probably won't be easy, according to Marsha Lovejoy. Marsha has taken her own battle with schizophrenia all the way to Congress, where she's fighting for jobs as well as understanding. People often don't want to hire you simply because they've that you're mentally ill. They assume that you're gonna going to blow up in front of their customers or, or maybe go crazy and, or attack one of their employees. They think that often that all schizophrenia is people with two personalities. And if you look fine at the end of the interview, then, aha, is the other side going to come out? She thinks of herself as having a disability and, as such, serves on a White House panel with other disabled Americans. And if you don't have a job and you don't have a chance at a job, um, you don't have any identity. You don't feel like you don't contribute to society. I think that's why suicide rate is so high among us, is because you live with so much hopelessness and so much, so many people telling us, no, you never can achieve, and, and are believing that we can never achieve. It's a message we heard time and again, especially from patients, that work is an essential part of recovery. It's the reason these people go to Guidance Center Industries, a unique program where patients at various stages of recovery can find jobs to suit them. It's important to note, however, this is something more than a traditional nonprofit sheltered workshop. Guidance Center Industry is a real work setting. It's a production-oriented setting. People do have to come to work. They have to behave, pay a reasonable wage. We modulate the stress there. We can encourage people to do more. They get much more individualized attention. The best thing about it is just the motivation to get out of the house and be doing something productive rather than watch TV and goofing off and or else going to a, a, a treatment program and vegging out all day. We've tried to de-emphasize, if you will, the illness and to compete in the marketplace by offering a good or a service that uh, meets the demand of the community at large. The jobs range in complexity from graffiti removal to baking. Jennifer, who for years had bounced between the streets and the mental ward, has been a protege of a very gifted French pastry chef. She is learning the delicate art of making Napoleons and torts. I like the atmosphere. It's very clean. Um, it's very busy. I have to be very busy in order to concentrate anything that was unreal. And it was very hard for me to concentrate, but um, 
I see now that the bakery is a reality. It's changing my life. Um, it make it gives me more responsibility. For 40 years, Fountain House in New York City has been taking people one step further by combining the need to work with the need to social. Fountain House, in fact, is a clubhouse where all 800 members function, be it working on their house television program, teaching classes to fellow members, or doing bookkeeping at the house bank. It is a model program that has been copied in cities across the country. Work is essential to life, really, for everybody. Everybody wants to at least be useful and productive and feel needed by somebody in that sense. So we take the work for the Fountain House itself, that's really generated by being here, and turn that into opportunities for the members to refine themselves as uh, competent and productive people. And then guarantee that they have a right to go to work in a regular place of business at regular wages in the community as soon as that's feasible for them. A number of local companies offer transitional jobs to workers like Susan. She got the confidence from Fountain House. See, in here we're not patients. We're members. We're contributing to Fountain House with our work. We're, we're part of a going concern. We're not uh, being treated. We're part of the action. At age 50, Susan continues a lifelong battle with schizophrenia. But she is determined to overcome her age and her illness and eventually become a college mathematics instructor. Gets us to a big word, hope. I mean, when I, when I was in, when I, I was hospitalized, I'm hospitalized, I have no future. And the biggest thing that Fountain House gives you is the future. It gives you plans, it gives you something to fall back on. When I, I, I used to say to myself in the old days, mental illness, you know, and over the doors of Dante's Inferno is written, all ye who enter here lose all hope. At Fountain House, your hope back. Now another important issue is the family movement. Nowadays, 70,000 families are united in a strong consumer voice called the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. They are advocating that the patients receive better services and that the social stigma of mental illness be erased. Now, some very knowledgeable people believe that the first place that these negative attitudes should be addressed is right here at home. Well, T. George Harris, our weekly commentator and editor-in-chief of American Health Magazine, has some thoughts on this issue as well. The more we know about the chemistry of the body, the more we learn about our subtle influences on each other, the chemistry of everyday life. Consider the families of schizophrenics in a big veterans hospital in Southern California. Using pill therapy, doctors are able to get many of them home again, back to family life and hope. But there's a big difference among families. Some are calm and loving, but others are embarrassed and critical. You can tell a lot by tone of voice. If mom or sis talks in a high voice, more than half veterans are soon back in the hospital. I thought about those vets this morning on New York subway. There was a beggar shaking a cup, one of thousands of homeless who used to be sheltered in mental hospitals. When he shuffled up to a tense man in a business suit, all he got was an angry shove. I could feel him losing his grip on reality. He seemed to fade away. You see, science is beginning to show how the hostile chemistry inside us can actually poison the people around us. Well, I hate to tell you folks, but we run out of time, and I want to have to get out of here. Next time on Body Watch, we'll enter the world and minds of two to four million children struggling with learning disorders. How about some eraser action on that right there? What causes it? Is it simply a matter of raw intelligence or the result of a deep biological problem? What happens when these kids are left undiagnosed and untreated? And what is the controversy and the hope behind the varied and sometimes innovative approaches to treatment? The well, show sure want to thank you folks for watching Body Watch. See you next week. I guarantee you that. Let's go, bud. Body Watch is made possible the makers of NutraSweet brand sweeteners. Taking good care of ourselves makes life a little better. And NutraSweet makes it a little sweeter.
order a transcript of this program, please send $5 to Body Watch, P.O. Box 22, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. Please include the name of the program.